have three weeks together. Okay, and I want to recommend to you and suggest to you that to make a commitment. I realize that it's hard to say what you're going to be doing next Sunday and the Sunday after that. But there was a, a lady that walked in this evening, and she held her Bible in her hand. She looked at me, and she said, Deacon Sabatino, I don't even know what to do with this. Okay? We've got a problem. We've got a problem. And it's a problem I hope we're going to take a first step in solving over the next few weeks. And that is basic Bible literacy. How do we open up our Bible and find our way through it? And if you say, I already know how to do that, I'm still going to suggest you do it. I know how to do it. I do, for the most part. I don't know everything. There's many things I need to learn. But let me tell you that I do what we are going to be doing over the next three weeks. I do on a weekly basis in my head. I do it on a weekly basis and sometimes more often than that with my children. Where we start with Adam and we walk to Jesus Christ by memory, knowing every major event and every major person and how they're related one to the other. You say, I don't think I could pull that off. Well, my six-year-old daughter can and my four-year-old son can and I think pretty soon my two-year-old son will be able to, okay? Why? Because that's what we do in our house. That's what we do on the way to church. And so I, I only say that to you because I myself have to do it on a regular basis. This is one of my favorite programs that we do at the Institute of Catholic Culture. I like to do it every single year. We skipped last year. But simply to refresh ourselves, to open up our Bibles and do this again until it becomes so easy for us that you can be asked any person in the Bible and you're going to know exactly where they fit into the story. Because these are our ancestors. These are the great men and women that came before us that have handed on the faith to us. It's absolutely essential that we come to know who these people are so that we can come to know who we are. And then our faith is founded upon a solid foundation, not built upon sand. Okay? So what are we going to be doing? We're going to be walking from page one to the end over the next three weeks. We're going to cover the entire Bible. We're going to put it all in order. We're going to know all of those major figures. And if you say to me, I don't know the major figures, you're going to know the major figures. You're going to be able to tell me how Noah is related to Adam and how Noah is related to King David and how King David is related to, to Jesus Christ and so forth. So that by the time we walk out of here in three weeks, if you make that commitment with me, you're going to be able to tell your neighbor every major person and every major event and how they're related one to another from the G book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. Do you believe me? Oh, you probably don't believe me. <laughs> so, we're going to start slow. One of the requests I had was, Deacon Sabatino, last time I did this with you, you went too fast. And we've got to go fast if we're going to cover the whole Bible. Okay? How many of you don't have your Bible on you tonight? Okay, you've got to bring your Bible with you. You've got to bring your Bible with you over the next few weeks. First of all, just open up with me. We're going to do a real quick exercise, and we're just going to flip through our Bible real fast. And you say, I already know all this. That's okay. We've got to do it. I do too, but I need to do it to help myself remember. Okay? And so the first five books of the Old Testament are called the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch. And you'll see Genesis. Just flip with me. Okay, humor me. Genesis. What comes next? Exodus. Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. See, you didn't want to say Joshua. You didn't know what came next, did you? Joshua. You know what? The story of Joshua, when they come back into the Holy Land after the Exodus. So you know where you are in the, sh in the story. Judges. You all know Samson, don't you? This is where Samson's written about, okay, in Judges. You have First and Second Samuel and first and second kings, you're with me? Keep keep flipping. First and second Samuel, first and second kings, and first and second chronicles. These six books are the story of the kings. You all know about King David. You've heard of King David and Solomon. That's where they're written about. Okay? We're gonna make all that make sense and how they're related to each other. 
And then right after uh, First and Second Chronicles, we have the Babylonian exile. It's not there. I mean, it's um, not one of your books, but it happened. And then you have Ezra and Nehemiah. And then you get into the wisdom literature, and you're going to find, as you're flipping through, your Proverbs, and you're going to find Psalms. You see, Psalms. everybody finds Psalms. Now, so we saw, we said the, the Pentateuch, or the, the story of the, the patriarchs, then we have the historical books of the Bible. Then we have now the wisdom literature. And following the wisdom literature, we have what? The prophets, and those prophets then will take you, I know I'm being a little loose here, all the way up to the New Testament, okay? And the prophets are laid out in your Bible from longest to shortest, for the most part. If there is two texts related to each other, they'll put those together. And so you'll see the prophet Jeremiah, which is one of the longer prophecies, and right after the prophet Jeremiah is the book of Lamentations, Lamentations of Jeremiah. Lamentations are very short. They tack it right there next to Jeremiah. So you can find your prophets longest to shortest, for the most part. And then your Bibles, some of your Bibles will conclude with 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Some of your Bibles will put 1st and 2nd Maccabees back there with the historical books. If you're looking at a new American, most likely yours did that. All right? Are you with me or am I losing you already? All right, and then you're into the New Testament, right? Open up your New Testament. Where is Melanie? (laughs) Melanie, could you go down the hallway and see if you can find a Bible in the Catholic Church here? Uh, If we have a stack of them somewhere, maybe we could hand them around. You know, I know there's some that exist. It's just a matter of whether we can get our hands on them or not. And you've got your New Testament, and following the Gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have Acts of the Apostles, flip there, everybody's together with me, and following Acts of the Apostles, you have the Epistles of St. Paul. And again, the Epistles of St. Paul, for the most part, are written longest to shortest, but first, all of the communities that St. Paul wrote to. Okay, so once you turn from Acts, you're going to turn to all the epistles that were written to communities, right? Like the Corinthians and the Ephesians and so forth. And then all of the epistles written to people like Timothy and so forth, okay? And then you have finally what you call, what we call the Catholic epistles. Not because the Protestants don't have them, but because they are epistles written to the universal church. Meaning not to a particular community. Okay, and so you have the epistles of Peter and of James and of Jude and and so forth. And then finally, the book of Revelation. You're with me. All right. I hope that was a little bit helpful, because as we're turning, I'm going to be able to say to you, Corinthians, and you're going to now be able to go right there because, you know, it follows Acts and it is written to a community. Right. And so it's right within those texts. I don't know which one comes first and second. You'll be able to find it by flipping. Okay, and similarly as we're going through the Old Testament, we're going to be turning our Bibles a lot together. Don't get frustrated. Okay, be challenged, but not frustrated. I would recommend, and if you start to get frustrated, if you start to get frustrated just now with me a little bit, like I couldn't move fast enough. Very simple. Go home and do what I just did with you and do it two and three times. And guess what? You solved your problem. Okay. And you can do that now over the next few weeks, familiarizing yourself with all of these texts. If you want, you can memorize them all in order. That would be helpful. Okay, I want to give you a couple of tools here at the beginning. As you're reading your Bible, please do not be so pietistic that you think you cannot write in your Bible. I love piety and holiness, but let me tell you, the Word of God is written for our salvation. If it never gets off the page and into our soul, we've got a problem. And so it's my opinion that whatever it takes to get it off the page and into your heart, you got to do it. We don't believe, we're not, we don't call ourselves a people of the book. 
We are a people of the living word of God. And unless this book gets off of this page and into you and starts living, and the living word of God becomes incarnate in our hearts, then guess what? This book might as well not have been written. Okay? It's the word of God. It's meant to take life and be enfleshed and be lived out now. And so I recommend to you, go down to um, Staples or one of these places and pick up a few highlighters, okay? I like these ones, the Sharpie Accent. If you're taking notes, write that down. Sharpie Accent. They don't bleed through the paper. Uh, they don't put too much, uh, you know, stuff out. They're not too uh, dark, so you can see through it still. Uh, and I use, uh, you I don't have all of my highlighters here with me, I should, but you know, you've get you can get orange, green, pink, yellow, um, uh, blue, and purple, I think. Those are my six, okay? And then you can start using them in according to themes, okay? For example, if you found something that had to do with God giving his life to us, what color would you use? Red, uh, yellow. Thank you. <laughs> Fine. No, no, that's good. I would use green, okay? I would use green. But if yellow makes sense to you, then use yellow, I have a little code in the front of my Bible, which I follow somewhat. And when I highlight my Bible, it's there, and uh, I use orange for covenant. Why? I don't know, but I started that way. I use purple for, thank you, royalty, whenever the kingdom of God is mentioned, all right? I have a little ruler, a little miniature ruler, and I have a pen, which I now have dropped because I was using it this weekend, and it's probably my suit jacket. One of those pens that has four different colors in it, you go click green, blue, red, and black, right? Okay, I use that. And I, w if I see connections between two parts uh, in, a t in a text, I'll draw a line so that I, my, I can open up my, t my Bible and immediately um, I can see a connection between two points, okay? And I'll just show that to you so you can see what you can do. It looks like I didn't like my Bible very much. I crossed everything out, okay? But I don't, I, I, it's not that I didn't like it, but I'm making connections between words. So I can look at, watch how fast this happens, okay? Good and evil. I'm following my green line right up. Like God knowing good and evil, two pages apart. Hmm? It's a theme, and I can watch that theme, and I can, and I can connect it sometimes three and four different places, and suddenly it helps me to be studying the text and making those connections, okay? Whatever it takes to help you, do it. Do it. All right. Any questions about that? Finally, a little tool. A little, <laughs> I bought my big tool. This is called a concordance. It's a word concordance. What's a word concordance? I can look up the word baptism, and it's going to give me every single time that word is used. Or Abraham, every time that word is used. Or a location, every time that word is used, you know, a Jerusalem. And so I can start to find other places in the Bible where these themes are appearing, and I can start to make connections that way. They make a nice as a Strong's concordance. This is a Protestant concordance. But I'll tell you what, the Catholics haven't written one nearly as nice as this. You can go down to uh, Barnes & Noble. Do, are they still in business, Barnes & Noble? Yeah. Whatever. The point is, you can go down there. Don't buy the latest version of this. Buy last year's version, and you get a lot cheaper. And guess what? The Bible didn't change. They just changed the cover. And so as you can pick up something like this, like 10 bucks. But I recommend for you to get the small version. I've got a little tiny one that I carry around with me all the time. And, um, and you can carry that with you. So it's, it's, it's another tool. And your last tool is a, um, is a, uh, a map. you got to have some maps. So get, go down and get yourself a little, um, what do you want to call it? What are they called? An atlas. Okay. Now, I picked up this little atlas of the Bible lands back when I was in college. It was th four times the size of this. I went down to the printer. I said, shrink it for me to this, these dimensions. They shrunk it. I can now place it in my Bible cover, and I've got an atlas with me wherever I go. That mean, And I was using this on the airplane. I was talking to this. Oh, I love airplanes and Bibles. I sat down. Sure enough, God put me next to a Jew. And 
we had the greatest discussion. And he was, he had, it was consulting his, his Hebrew text, and I was asking all sorts of questions that I wanted to share with you today, and we were back and forth like that. So um, anyways, those are some little tools that you can use. If you want to be serious, you got to get serious, okay? So I, I'm tired of people saying, but what version of the Bible should I use, right? You have that question, don't you? Be ad admit it. You have that question. Read whatever version you have, because if you don't read it, uh, at least you're reading something, right? At least don't hide behind the fact that you don't have the right version. Now, there are better versions than others, but at least pull it out for the love of God and dust it off and start reading. And once you start reading, then worry about making sure you get the right translation once you know you're really serious about what you're doing, Okay. So those are a few pointers and a few tools that I hope you can take home with you and make use of um, so that you can read and you don't and, and read with profit that you can this is your book that you can open it on your own and not get lost. And that's exactly what we're going to solve over the next three weeks together that you can walk through the Bible and not get lost. Okay. Now I meant to write these up earlier. Adam and Eve. How many of you recognize those names? <laughs> Raise your hand. Humor me. <laughs> Noah. Thank you. Abraham. I'll just put an A there. Oh, I got to put Abraham. Okay. Uh, the Babylonian exile. Be honest. Ah, see, we see a little bit shaky, don't we? The Babylonian exile. You gotta love my handwriting. Uh, how about this? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, how many of you know the name of the third son of Adam? A few of you who have done a Bible study with me before. Let me tell you that if you can't tell me who the third son of Adam was, you will not know who Noah was. He'll be a person, but you won't know really who he was because you won't know who his fathers were, who his sons are, and so forth. How many of you know who Enoch was? Mm, not too good. If you don't know who Enoch was, again, you're not going to have a clue who Noah is. Enoch was the, what, great-great-grandfather of Noah. We're going to look at that. How many of you know where Mount Moriah was, historically? Mount Moriah. Not too good. If you don't know where Mount Moriah was, then you do not know the story of Abraham's sacrifice of his son Isaac. You thought you did. You thought you did, but you don't. How many of you know who Jeroboam was? Jeroboam. If you don't know who Jeroboam was, you won't know why there was a Babylonian exile. When the Pharisees went to the Jordan River and they said to John the Baptist, Are you the prophet? What did he say? He said, No. Who was the prophet? Hmm. What was their next question? Are you Elijah? Ah, so the prophet wasn't Elijah, was it? No, if you don't know who the prophet among the Jews was, and the Pharisees are coming down to identify who the Messiah was, and their question is, are you the prophet trying to find the Messiah? Guess what? You're not going to know who Jesus Christ is from a Jewish perspective. Okay? Do you see the problem? What we as Catholics, and uh, there's something good about our situation, it's this. We, first of all, we're like browbeaten 
children, okay? Abused children. We've been told that, now, for our Protestants that are with us, um, look, you're wrong. <laughs> Catholics know their Bible. They just don't know it like you know it. We know it in two different ways, okay? Catholics know the stories of the Bible. You know virtually every story of the Bible. You just don't have a clue on how those stories are related one to the other. We know all of the major events, but we don't know the bridge stories, the stories which connect those events one to the other. We couldn't tell you how the flood is related to the sacrifice of Isaac or how the sacrifice of Isaac is related to Joseph, huh? You know the story of Joseph, right? And his robe of many colors and so, yeah, of course. But what's the context of that story? What's the story that comes just before it and just after it? What's the narrative? So over the next few weeks, we're going to be building those bridges together, building those bridges so you can, can connect the flood with the story of Joseph and the story of Joseph with King David and King David with the Babylonian exile and the Babylonian exile with, with Ezra and Ezra with Jeremiah and Jeremiah with the Maccabees and the Maccabees with St. Paul so that you can see the whole framework you can see the beautiful tapestry that has been built. The Bible is a collection of many books. Many books. 73 books in your Catholic Bible. Written by many different people. And when in our last series, we talked about how that inspiration takes place so that God inspires the author while using the person's talents and gifts and way of life. So that every book of the Bible has the fingerprint of its author. You can literally see the author when you're reading their book. That's nice, but it's also difficult. Because every author writes differently, doesn't he? And so from book to book, we're going to find that there's different forms, different styles of writing. But underneath those 73 books, underneath all of those human authors, is the one author, God, who weaves a wonderful tale of salvation from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation so that you can read, and if you read with the right eyes, and you can see through the hands of the human author to the hand of the divine author, you will be able to see the story of salvation stretch across thousands of years, 73 different books, many different authors, one story, the story of salvation history. That's going to be our goal. What do we normally do? We open our Bible. We start reading it. When do we start reading our Bible? January 1st, right? Oh, I'm going to make this year different. I'm not going to eat too much, and I'm going to start reading the Bible. How many of us have started reading the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 on January 1st? Oh, come on. What about at the beginning of Lent? Yeah. Okay. And what happens? We start reading, and what happens? Tell me what happens. You get to Leviticus, <laughs> and you want to jump off the Empire State Building. You close your Bible, and you put it away, don't you? What else? What other things do you hit? What other cause, what things cause problems for us? The begats. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Yeah, the begats are a disaster. And guess what? They're right there in chapter 4 of the book of Genesis. If you made it to Leviticus, you're a pretty hardcore. <laughs> Most people don't make it out of Genesis. Most people get to chapter 4 and they say, that's ridiculous. I can't deal with this. And they go back to the New York Times. Okay? God forbid. So, what are we going to do? First of all, to realize that everything in the Bible matters. Do you think if you believed that God had chosen your people out of the entire human race to save the world, do you think in your book where you tell that story you would put things that don't matter? 
No. Everything in the Bible matters. And usually the things which we think are the least important are the most important. And so we get to the begats and we skip them, don't we? Maybe we, if we haven't closed our Bible. Come on, guys, tell me yes. Respond to me. All right? We, yeah, we close our Bible or we skip them. Well, let me tell you right now that if you skip them, you're going to be lost. If you skip the book of Leviticus in the sense that you just say, I don't care. I'm going to tell you a little bit that you shouldn't care so much about the book of Leviticus l later on. But in its proper context. In its proper context. We have to understand why these things are there. And only when we start to understand why they're there will we be able to make use of why they're there for our salvation. Now, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 1, but I just want to paint a quick little picture for you. In the first few chapters of Genesis, God plants a garden. And in the midst of that garden, he plants... The tree of life and the tree of knowledge. If Adam and Eve were to eat from the tree of life, what would happen? They would live forever. And flowing through the midst of that garden was a river, which we call the river of life, which fed the garden and flowed out to water the whole world. Okay? And there in that garden, man was to come and to eat from the tree of life and to live forever. Now I want you to turn from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. To the last chapter of the book of Revelation. Chapter 22. Actually, we'll go to chapter 21 and then chapter 22. Chapter 21, verse 1. You're with me? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. What do you think a new heaven and a new earth is going to look like? Huh? Look at chapter 22, verse 1. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, through the middle of the streets of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life. Huh? The Garden of Eden in the book of Revelation. The entire Bible is the story of God's home and our journey back to that home. Our exile, oftentimes, through sin from that place of God's life, from that place of salvation, and then God's calling mankind back to paradise to give us, again, access to eternal life. The whole Bible is the story of that journey. And if you keep that journey in the forefront of your mind, you will not get lost when you're reading the sacred scriptures. Everything is about that journey. Every story, every relationship, every conversation has to do with that one topic, that God has made a home among men. And he wants us to dwell there with him. And when man sins, he places himself outside of the house of God. And when man lives the life of virtue, of grace, he finds himself back in the home of God. Everything we talk about over the next three weeks will be about that journey. All right, now turn back to the book of Genesis. We are going to be flying I'm going to be talking fast. You're going to be writing notes. Stop me if I lose you. Stop me if you have a question. This is going to be a much more of a practicum than we're used to. I'm not going to simply be lecturing at you. If you have questions, if you start to get lost, don't be embarrassed. S put up your hand. Wait a minute. What are you talking about? Say it again. And we'll get through it together. I will hold your hand, and you will hold mine. And together we'll hold the hand of Jesus. Okay? And we won't get lost, and we hopefully won't get frustrated, and we'll find our way from the Garden of Eden back to the Garden of Eden. Amen?
Okay. I need to point out a few themes. We are not going to be stopping in the stories you already know. How many of you know the story of Adam and Eve? Thank you. We don't have to talk about it. If you get to a point where I say we're skipping this story, and you say, wait a minute, Deacon Sabatino, I don't know that story, then write it down in your notepad, and that's your homework. <laughs> Very simple. Okay? Very easy. So we don't need to cover too much about Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, except you need some basic themes. Because if the story is about paradise, then we better have our basic themes down to be able to recognize when God's calling us back. So that when we walk back into his home, we can recognize our home again. We know what it's supposed to look like. We know what it doesn't look like. Okay? And so I want to give you a few themes. First of all, in Genesis chapter 1, there are how many days in creation? And on the sixth day, God created? If you write it down, it's verse 26. And man is made in the? The image and likeness of God. And man is told to have dominion over creation. What kind of a person has dominion over creation? A king. Adam's job in paradise was to set society in order. To place each part of society in its, reg in its place where it was supposed to be. So all of the garden could function properly and together could become fruitful and multiply and become beautiful and flower and become what God had wanted it to become. Yes, sir. Yes. Absolutely. Except that I have to cover the entire Bible in three weeks. So I may not be saying every single thing I could say. I need you to grab some themes. Okay? I need you to grab some points that are very important to be able to put in our bag for our journey. Okay? And the first thing you got to realize is that man is made to be a king in creation. He's made to be a king in as a reflection of in the image and likeness of the king of all of God who set creation in order in the beginning and notice what we see in Genesis chapter 20 uh, chapter 1 verse 28 and God blessed them this blessing is fundamentally important for our story because we will see many blessings along the way. This is the patriarchal or fatherly blessing by which he bestows upon his son that which was his. God is the king of creation. And now he makes man to image him, to be like him, to be a king of creation. And here with this blessing of Adam and Eve, he raises them up to stand in his shoes, to be the head of the family of God. We are going to see that blessing continue on now, and we're going to follow that blessing from Adam to Jesus Christ. On the seventh day, God blessed his creation. And in the Hebrew, the word for seven has a common root. It shares a common uh, root word with the word for covenant or oath. Okay? Why is this important? Because oftentimes, things are done according to the number seven, or in a seven repetition, or in the pattern of seven, like seven days, to symbolize something more than simply seven days. God creates in seven days to tell his creation that he desires to have a covenant with them. What is a covenant? What happens in a covenant? Two parties, they become one with each other. Huh? Today we call it contract. In a contract, I sign on a piece of paper, the other person signs on the piece of paper, and we promise to be in agreement about that point. We promise to be one. 
A covenant is a, even a more of a deep contract by which two come into a relationship with each other to share a common life. God created in the beginning in order to form us into a union with him. He created within a seven-day structure. I said in the, uh, earlier that in that p garden he planted two trees. You'll see that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. Out of, the go out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that was pleasant to sight and good for food the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if they ate from the tree of life, they would? And if they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they would? They would surely die. When we speak of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, this is called a Hebrew mirrorism, where it's a, it's a, a literary way of expressing the fullness or the full extent of a thing. Huh? From, from good to evil, all knowledge. The fathers tell us that Adam and Eve were meant to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but only in obedience at the right time, once God prepared them for it. He said, don't eat yet, just like I tell my children, don't touch the oven. Huh? The cookies in there are for you, and someday I'm going to be able to show you how to open the oven and get them out if I do my job right. But not yet. And Adam and Eve, as you know, were disobedient. And they received, instead of life, death. Notice that in Genesis chapter 2, when God says that they're not to eat from the tree of knowledge, he doesn't say, on the day that you eat of it, I will kill you. He says, you will surely die. You will place yourself outside of a relationship with me. And only in relationship with God do we live forever. God does not condemn us to death. We condemn ourselves to death. Just like if we decided to turn off the lights in this room, there would be no more light. There would be a lack of light. And so similarly, if Adam and Eve decide, and we and the, all of the men we're going to meet decide to walk away from God, then guess what we're going to have? We're going to have death as the consequence of man's choice, not as the condemnation of God. God desires us to live. Does that make sense? absolutely fundamental as we move forward and we see people dying in sacred scripture we do we see a lot of people dying we see a lot of war and death we're going to have to deal with that but we have to always put at the forefront of our mind that god stands knocking at the door but when we decide to close the door the lights turn off not because god desires it to be that way okay yes my second theme. I've got, I, you know, I know I've got like eight themes here. I don't know where the one comes and one goes, but I mean, you've got to know about image and likeness. You need to know about the seven-day structure. You need to know about the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. You've got to know about life and death, blessing and curse. When Adam and Eve sinned and they ate from the tree of knowledge, God walked into the garden. And what did Adam do? Yeah, look at verse 8 of chapter 3. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from God. Huh? They closed the door. They hid themselves from God. We will have this theme throughout Scripture of those who walk with God and those who do not. When you walk with God, you receive life. When you walk away from God, when you hide from him, you receive death. Also, in the beginning, Adam and Eve were made 
And the scriptures tell us, naked and unashamed. The fathers of the church, though, say, but they were clothed in the grace of God. So that though they were naked, as we commonly think about clothing, they were robed in glory. So that when Adam and Eve freely chose to walk away from their father, to take off that robe of glory, then and only then did they realize that they were naked and they were ashamed of their nakedness. Because now man was found without grace, without that important element by which God had made him as his image and likeness. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we get the beginning of what will take thousands of years to solve. The, what we call the Proto-Evangelium, the first good news. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will put between enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, speaking to the serpent, he shall crush your head, and you shall crush his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children, and so forth. Right here at the beginning, just as the fall takes place, we get the first good news that one day, through the seed of the woman, God will bring about the destruction of the devil. Right here at the beginning, we get the news not only that there will be a good ending, but that before that good ending is brought about, there will be a battle. A battle between humanity, the seed of the woman, and the serpent who is striking there will be a fight. And where there is a fight and a battle, there will be blood and there will be death. I bring this up now because as we stand here in 2012, I think we become so sensitized to this whole thing. We need to realize that God desires us to live. And when man puts himself on the side of the devil, then what will be revealed in man's life is what is truly going on in his life, namely death. As one priest I know says, that there are many more people today who are lying peacefully in the tomb and yet are alive in God then there are living people walking on this earth who are actually dead. Huh? Life is about more than standing here on earth. Life is about being alive in our soul. And so oftentimes when death occurs in the soul, that death will be revealed in physical form. So we say, oh, that's so mean of God to let that happen. God is simply letting happen what he has been trying to stop. He is merely revealing to us what has already taken place. That when we find men dying in the battles of war, as they take the side of the enemies of God, what is being manifest and revealed is merely the end result of what has already happened in their heart. All through salvation history, then, we will see this battle played out. A battle between God, who is relentless in desiring our life, who will not stop until he saves man. And we will see the devil taking man for himself, and placing man in the midst of that battle, and death results, and blood is poured out. And God will not stop battling for man until he wins at the moment of the resurrection. 
That battle now will be the story of salvation history. If you ever thought the Bible was boring, put on your seatbelts. Because let me tell you, it is the greatest story of the battle that has ever taken place on this earth. It is a battle for humanity. And God will not lose. He will not lose. And the harder the devil fights, the more blood will be spilt upon this earth until God finally crushes the head of the serpent through the power of the mother of God. That is the story that we are going to witness now from Genesis all the way to the New Testament. We cannot lose sight of that. Now, how am I doing? What time do we start tonight? Okay, I didn't even tell you how long we're going. You, I hope you read your flyer. These programs are two hours each. Okay? We're going from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. And you say, that's a long time. It's a big Bible. Okay? <laughs> you got to give me a little bit of time together. So now, we've s finished our introduction. We're well on our way. We're going to hit Genesis. And by the time you walk out of here tonight, we're going to be done with Genesis and maybe into Exodus. Okay? And then we'll be flying all the way through Scripture. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a three-minute break.